Our guest for this Royal Welsh College of Music and Drama live lockdown lowdown is a singer of extraordinary breadth who has become particularly world famous for her chameleon-like approach to singing and for her in interpretation of modern and contemporary music. She studied voice at the Eastman School of Music in Rochester, New York, and received her bachelor's degree with distinction in 1984. And in the same year, she moved to the Netherlands where she currently lives and has proven herself to be one of the most versatile singers of her generation. Claren McFadden made her opera debut in the Holland Festival in 1985, and in the following year made her debut with William Christie in Rameau's Anna Créon with Opera Lyrique du Rhin. She was invited many times to work with William Christie, touring extensively in the US, South America, Europe, and the Soviet Union. Her Covent Garden debut, also under William Christie, was the Graham Vick production of Purcell's King Arthur. Highlights from her varied and extensive operatic career include Cervinetta in Graham Vick's Ariadne of Naxos at Netherlands Opera, where she is a regular guest. Her notable performances of Sir Constance in Robert Carson's production, Poulenc's Dialogue of the Carmelites, are an example. She sang the title role in Cavalli's La Didone at La Fenice in Venice. A famous Kleinborn debut as the title role of Graham Vick's Lulu, conducted by Sir Andrew Davis, and creating the role of the controller in Jonathan Dove's opera Flight, directed by Richard Jones. In addition to her numerous operatic roles, Claren McFadden has also made a name for herself on the concert stage and is a regular guest at the BBC proms, including opening the 1999 proms in Tippett's The Mask of Time, conducted by Sir Andrew Davis, and Schoenberg's Pierre Lunaire with the Nash Ensemble. Claren is equally at home with oratorio, and because of her versatility, she has found herself often asked to perform with jazz musicians, such as the Jazz Orchestra of the Concert Gobal. Claren McFadden, welcome. It's so good to see you, um, and I'm especially delighted because you're sat in your car, uh, <laughs> because you've just, you've just finished a recording session, which is yes. brilliant news to all of us who are in the UK and worried when things are going to start opening up. Can you tell yes. us what you've been doing this afternoon? Yes, there's a, well, first of all, thank you very much. I mean, gosh, that's a long list of, of things. I'm like, gosh, a bit scared of that woman. <laughs> uh, there's a festival, a Bach festival uh, south in the southern part of Holland, um, where I would have done the opening this weekend because of, of Corona. They, they couldn't have it, uh, but they decided to have various local groups playing. So I was singing uh, the slow aria of the Bach uh, Semprado aria, Cantata 51 without trumpet, but with organ, which is filmed. And then they asked me to sing something completely different. So I said, well, what about John Cage's aria? So I did that with a 10 second delay. I was sharing your performance of that uh, John Cage aria. Uh, if anyone hasn't seen Clarence TEDx performance and, and the speech you gave on that before you sang, just so profoundly moving to me, the way you talked about breath and expression and the primal nature of singing. It was just amazing. Is Thank that you. an approach you take to all your singing? I do actually, yes. I observe babies a lot to see actually how they breathe and where their tongue position is. Yeah, I, I, I always find that, that they take proper breaths and their tongue is actually even almost concave to get, I think, the maximum amount of, of resonance in their in their head to, to be able to be heard. This is literally their, their survival, you know, depends on it. The breath and emotions are very connected and that's what we do as, as, as musicians, as singers especially, or, or what we do is very much connected to, to those two elements. There are many singers, uh, singing teachers, singing students uh, in the room tonight who I know will all be wanting to to speak to you and, and hearing you talk about breath in that way. But I'm going to begin the year three uh, harpist. Her name's Keris Rees. And uh, the reason I'm bringing Keris in now is because uh, it relates to what we've just been talking about. Keris, over to you. Hi, I watched uh, your performance of John Cage's piece and I'm also really interested in these types of graphic scores. And I was wondering, how do you approach them? Right, um, what I don't do is a lot of practice. It's more about mental preparation, finding a structure for myself, uh, and then reflecting on what I want to do and then trying it out a couple of times and then doing it. So for example, with, with this graphic score of, of, of Aria, I sat down with a coffee, big cup cappuccino, and just figured out which lines lent themselves to which vocal type. 
once I had worked through the whole score, just writing that. And then once I had the structure, when I actually did it once, I realized, ah, okay, maybe the red is better for a certain type of singing or the blue is for an, another type. And then I switched. But I, I didn't, a lot of students say, I have to practice. How do I practice John Cage's audience? If you don't, you reflect on it. It's the same with Sequenza. Reflect on, make good, good choices about what you want to do um, and then try it out easily and then adjust just to be clear, Claren, you're not saying that you don't practice other things. It's this approach to these graphic scores that you want yes. to be. And I think that was what really moved me about your performance of it was how in the moment uh, you are. And also the way you talked in that TEDx talk about your experience in Thailand on a meditative retreat and discovering being in the moment when you're singing is almost like a form of meditation. Yes, I mean, the, 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 well, when I did this, this, this retreat, uh, and it was a place that was just, nobody talks. Basically, there was no talking there. They would hang the food outside our, our huts, individual huts. I was quite astounded when the woman who was there asked me to sing. She's the one who actually said, it, it, it is like meditation, what you do. And I realized that, that when we are busy singing, we're busy with the breath. We're taking deep breaths for 20 minutes or half an hour or however long we're singing or an hour if it's a recital or whatever so that's what you do when you're, you're you're meditating and you're very focused on what you're doing but not to the exclusion of everything else so you're very much aware of what's going on around you especially to me it's like chamber music is meditation that, that's music making you hear your colleagues you tap into your colleagues and the devotion that you have with what, when you're singing you're not distracted by anything so it, it there's a direct parallel um, that she made with meditation and, it, and I thought yeah that makes perfect sense. Often and I think I'm speaking personally here there is when you approach a, you know a, a Ligeti score or John Cage score there is a sense of fear um, uh, but the complete sense of abandonment that you displayed uh, when when you were singing that is really amazing to to see that fearlessness is that fearlessness how you experience it or is being up there is it is it more scary than you make it look? Pretty much, yes, <laughs> terrifying. Um, people often say, or they, they describe me, and they say she just does whatever, and it just comes out. And when I tell people, actually, I'm one of the most controlled singers I know, then they, they kind of, they can't really get their head around it. I sort of say that that's what I mean by, by figuring out the structure of something, that for me, I need that structure to, to be able to have great freedom within it. But if I don't have a structure, then it's just chaos. And then I don't actually know what I'm doing. I'm sort of flinging energy out. I don't find that structure always by singing all the time because it's very tiring, uh, which is why I also say it's good with a score like that. It's very complicated to actually do more notation, more observing, making links between where you get your notes, where you don't, just marking the score up first. And I actually whistle a lot. I whistle the scores a lot. I find ways of putting everything in one octave. If it's a, a very complex score, or even Mozart for that, but, you know, where they have these giant jumps to get the, the, the line. And once I have the lyric line, then I can jump, make, put the octaves uh, back where they belong and I still keep the line. So basically that structure, I need to, to have that fearlessness. And if, and if not, then I'm quite timid. But it, is, it is a controlled approach that I, that I use. Serena, can I bring Serena in now? Serena is a, a first year Bima's singer. Listening to what you've said, I'd, I'd kind of like to ask a different question. Is that okay, Tim? Yeah, of course, of course. Um, you've talked about how singing is like meditation, and I, I find that all really fascinating. I'm wondering if it's not too personal a question. How does spirituality and meditation and your view of the world coming from that, how does that feed into how you perform? Quite a bit now, much more so after that, after that trip, actually. Before that trip, I didn't make the link at all. I was just... I never made the link that after a really intensely engaging performance that I felt so zen, so relaxed, so focused, so vibrant, so alive, so grounded, and so in touch with, with the cosmos. Yeah, after that, I, I actually thought about it and said, well, actually, it's every time it's there. So it's, I mean, what I also ask people that I've worked with, and I, I was asked that question myself, if I had to describe my singing what what does it look like and I've asked other people that as well and and there's usually there's something that's quite connected to air to movement to the cosmos to groundedness to water to the elements it sort of has changed in indeed my way and I, I can't say I'm more more spiritual singer but I, I am more 
aware of my connection to the spiritual world and that affects my singing as well not that i'm holy or this or that or i could kiss trees although i think trees are wonderful but um i try to tap into that that energy before i actually start can i come in on that as well and just ask you yeah. if you feel that in this lockdown period it's very possible to feel we're all existing in a, in a different almost time zone do you think that sense of connection to the world has increased as a result yeah absolutely the first thing i noticed is that people didn't really know what to do and they could go either way they could either go into a kind of reflection introspection which is what i chose to do which was i kind of took myself off the grid completely and other people were like we have to keep performing we have to find ways of going through this 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 thing and i thought well maybe it's, it's okay to, to just relax and and think and rest and figure out how it's going to be after this because it will it will never be the same what i've noticed in in resting and, and, and reflecting and and seeing it's given me personally a much calmer view on ruining the planet or that mother nature is is we're going to kill it what i saw is that the flowers were blooming like crazy i've never seen the flowers like they are now like they're screaming they're, the, the roses are wide open there are new, new species of birds i've never heard in, in the city so it, it, it made me feel like ah nature is kind of giving us a warning but with a gift beautiful weather you see the nature take time to reflect i don't think I have to worry about us ruining Mother Nature. I think with this little creature we can't even see that could potentially uh, wipe us out as a species, I think she might say, okay, I've had enough of you now. Let, let's see. Dinosaurs, humans, let's, let's see. So it gave me a sense of calm, actually, in, in that sense. And now, having started singing again, I, it comes from a place of calm. No stamina, but that's something else. But it's been, it's been a very good, for me, very, very good. That's a beautiful way of looking at it. On our college community, obviously, uh, this is the time of year when we're supposed to be doing operas and plays, and it's made, it had a profound effect. But feeling those lessons coming from it and that sense of calm you describe is so many people you hear saying i'm noticing the bird song the skies seem bluer it has been a, an opportunity for us to realize gosh this little orb with is spinning around in space is so so special and uh, yes absolutely look, absolutely yeah. serena you had some more questions do you want to put one of your others Please. I, I would love to. As our ideas as a culture swiftly change in regards to things like race, gender, relationships and sexuality, many operas and songs are becoming increasingly socially unacceptable. How do you see classical music changing to reflect this? Is it possible to have historically informed performances while still upholding modern day values? And if not, which is more important? Mm, very good question. Basically, of the school of thought that the things that are, have been historically uh, have been done, performed songs that are now no longer, let's say, politically correct or socially correct or, or whatever, the danger is to whitewash them so that you sort of just clean the words, you get rid of the songs, but that doesn't educate people. And I think personally, I would rather have somebody sing a song the way it was written but explain the context in which it, it was it was formed. So use it as a way of educating people now, explaining why it's no longer considered proper to do that. I would much prefer that because there's some beautiful music in the world that was written in, a ta in times when people had a different view of the world and everybody accepted that. Maybe it's controversial what I'm saying, but that, that's how I feel. I would rather that um, people do that than, than blank it all out. Wales is, is, has a very strong and proud rugby tradition. There's a song that's associated with the English rugby team, which has had a lot of controversy in, in recent weeks, and that's because English rugby fans sing Swing Low, Sweet Chariot, which of course was an African-American spiritual. Do you have a, pos a position on this? I don't think, I mean, it wasn't meant as something derogatory, was it? No, or was it's, what, it's what they sing when they're willing on the team. It's, it's kind of, in English rugby ter team, terms it's the highest respect when they're singing that song so it's certainly not derogatory but there has been some feeling that they should stop singing it because it doesn't belong to them mm, but then again if we go that route i would say then actually nine tenths of what i've been singing over the last 35 years doesn't belong to me either so that means i didn't grow up with classical music i didn't grow up in europe i think it's a very dangerous road to go on i think that because everything belongs to everybody I think when it's done with respect, I'd love to hear a bunch of guys with gorgeous thighs singing Swing Low, Sweet Chariot. You know what I mean? That's, it's, you mean if both. They sing, because that's what they're, they're, it's a sign of respect. I think 
I, I do really think the danger is, is when things are not spoken out um, in, a, in a clear way, then you don't have a dialogue. You don't have a, and then that means that people are afraid to, to, to do the things that are actually could help the world. I mean, I think that, that I love that idea that they would sing it and sing it with their full soul and, 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 and in a beautiful, beautiful way. Grace, uh, one of our uh, second year masters singers. I am such an enormous fan. If you'll in indulge me for a, a minute, I watched your TED talk when I was 14 and it, uh, was the thing that explained to me that um, music is art as well as, you know, painting and things. And, and I really took that on board and it ultimately is the decision that I made was to go into music. So thank well, you so much for, oh, for that. Thank you. I'm honored. Thank you. Uh, um, I wondered, your, your talk is so much about the, the, the rawness of, of the voice and how I think you were trying to give it to the audience and, and share your, your passion for music and for the human voice. I wonder if you have any thoughts about how we're going to do this going forward. Obviously, classical music and especially opera is sort of suffering under current mm. generations. Yes. And I, I wonder what your take is uh, on, on that, really. Right. how we can bring it forward. I mean, I, interesting, I was talking to somebody just today um, about this festival I was in, uh, just sang for, and they were saying that they would like to have younger people coming and lots of institutions, especially opera, classical music, are bemoaning the fact that, that, that young people don't, don't, don't come and how they can do it. And I asked somebody who was actually in the cloak room uh, at the opera house, and I said, it's interesting that you're down here taking the coats of all these, these people, but you're not up there, why not? And he said, well, it's because they don't approach us in our way, speaking our language and offering something that we can relate to. And they said, well, for us, it's more interactive now. There are more events. People are busy with a certain, a different way of experiencing things, which actually in a way was closer to how music was 200, 300 years ago, where the whole family would sit at an opera or, and have you know, their salami and their dinner and do their business and everything like that. And, I think that's why they started singing all these high notes in Handel operas is because it's only with the intention of the people's by swacking a high, you know, and they go, oh, you know that. So I think the important thing is to stay very much connected to the generation that is now, so that, that's you, and see how you can find a way of making it organic for, for you. Otherwise, it becomes a kind of relic kind of historical thing and it even means if you're singing music that was you know written a hundred or two hundred or three hundred or four hundred years ago that the emotions of it are what are, is is universal the emotions love hasn't changed in, in two thousand or a thousand years and no i don't think it will so it's finding that the newness uh, a new way of describing those emotions in a way that feels right for for your this generation Oh, what a great answer. Um, thank yeah. you so much. Um, if, would it be okay to ask another question, Tim? Go for it, Grace. Yeah. I just wondered how, you know, you're very well known for flying through a, a variety of, of genres. And I wondered what your approach is to keeping the voice um, centred and pure through all of them. It's quite simple, actually, that the technique that I have, I was very lucky that my, my first teacher was very, very good with, with technique in a very healthy bel canto way, on the breath, voce raccolto, inalare la voce, all these things. I always said that that's the basis for everything. So I don't change my technique when I sing, I just change my stylistic approach. And so the core is always there. If it's Bach or it's Duke Ellington or it's John Cage or it's Ligeti or Mozart, it, it's, it's the same approach. Thank you so much. Thank you, Claren. Uh, can I throw to Freya now, please? Freya is also a second year Emma's uh, opera speaker. Yes. Was there a, um, a specific piece of advice that you were given early in your career that you've held on to Again, my teacher, the one I started with him when I was 16. He was very strict. When he said anything like, oh, not bad, not bad at all, I would float out of the room. So he was, he was firm, but, 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 you know, gentle in that sense. He wasn't, you know, telling me I couldn't do this, I couldn't do that. But he said, Ari antiche, the seven crudeles, the ocho sate, di spiegarmi. Those are the things that will always check that those are like the apples of your vocal health. If you can sing them with purity and line, then the voice is good. 
And he said, there's some things you can sing now, when I was 18, 19, 20. He said, there's some things you can sing when you're, you'll sing when you're 30 or 40 or 50. And he said, there's some things that you will never sing. And if you respect what I call now the temperament of the voice, which may be different from your own personal temperament, if you respect that temperament, then you'll sing until you just don't want to anymore, rather than that the voice says, can't do it anymore. And I see it generation after generation that people come and they look in and, and I, I can hear now that, ah, their temperament, nobody likes singing, you know, chambermaids because, or whatever. They, everybody wants to sing more meaty roles and have more of a journey, more of that. But if your voice is saying, I'm an Adele or I'm a Blanchin or, or, or whatever, and you try to make it sing Pamina or Fior di Ligi, after a while you'll, you'll get into trouble. So that, that was the best advice he ever said. He said, you can try, you know, every now and then it's good to push, not push, uh, challenge the voice, but then you step right back into your, it's like running one half a mile more than when you're you know, used to, just to see what it feels like and, and get your body used to something else. But you always go back to, to where the voice says, I'm happy here. So interesting, Clara, because <clears throat> somebody at, you know, your level of career, to hear somebody like yourself saying, Aria Antique, uh, you know, so often it's easy to look at the yellow book of 24 Italian songs and arias and just think, oh yeah, I did that in the first two years of singing. Mm-hmm. Do you still check in with those Caro Mio Vens and Perla Gloria? I so- yes, I do. I, and if I sing them, I still approach them with the same musicality that I would approach anything else I do now. And then I can actually, it's important because I can see how I've gotten better, thank goodness, <laughs> uh, with breath control, with line, with, with those sorts of things. Because it's, it's basically basic, bel canto, good, healthy singing to be able to sing them. So, and it's not too complicated with language. It's, it's quite, they're quite, yeah, they're like basic building blocks. So I think it's good sometimes. Even with a house, we go back and check the foundation of our house. We don't just leave it and for the termites to rot it, we check. You adjust it if it needs to, but you always check that, that it, the house, is, the, the foundation is stable. I just made that up, but he didn't tell me that. <laughs> it's, it's beautiful. And, you know, th- we're talking about singing now because we're talking to a singer, but it's as applicable to a pianist or a violinist or, a, or it is that checking in with the fundamentals of yes. technique. You mentioned musicality there and your musicality shines through when you sing. Did you have any other instruments uh, that, that you played? And how important do you think developing general musicianship is? I think it's extremely important. I, I, I did. I played the oboe. I played the oboe from the age of eight to 18. I played folk guitar. And that's kind of how I, I you know, earned money putting myself to college a little bit. Folks guitar. I played a glockenspiel in the band, in the marching band in high school. I played trombone in the jazz band. I had just like a five notes, <laughs> but I, I still improvise with my five notes. But um, yeah, I think it, it, it is really, really important for, for singers to have a general musicality from a harmonic point of view, because we're sort of taught generally to think linearly. The melody is the most important thing and everything around it and underneath it is a compliment. If you, for example, look at Bach, I mean, I approach it in a very instrumental way because there is a linear aspect to it, but there's also this vertical aspect, harmonic aspect, where the singer is actually the, the cornerstone of the harmonic change. And if you're not aware of that, then you sort of gloss over, or could gloss over some very important means of creating tension, and which I think is pretty much very important in music in general, um, in a world music in particular, is how you create tension and resolution. And if you know in your melody that you this note becomes the certain position in a certain other chord which sets us on another path that's really a bonus and in fact in the, i'm not plugging my, my, my course but um what we've done actually is have actually instantly composed our own songs in the style of bach or in the style of mozart or in the style of handel and then you realize singers have a very good ear but a lot of singers don't have the same theory background so they the, the rules of counterpoint this sort of thing so you, just basic things and what makes mozart mozart and what makes Schumann sound like Schumann or Debussy sound like Debussy. And if you know that, then you can actually um, really focus in on what it is that, that inspired those, those composers to write in a certain way. You mentioned there your course and, and your method, um, which just sounds so fascinating. And guys, I'm absolutely desperate to get Clarence to Cardiff to, to work with, with us. Can you, can you share a little bit about this new way of working you're discovering? Yeah. 
Yes, it started where I myself was asked to join a project with free improvisers. The composition was a snare drum role and I was just panicked. I had no idea what to do. Then discovered uh, there's a whole other world between the notes, overtones, undertones that create even other notes. So I was very fascinated with the fear that I had when it was blocking me. I couldn't really, I couldn't create uh, intuitively. And when I, the fear was on my shoulder, let's say, then magic started to happen with my own thing. I started to be able to be freer with my voice because I wasn't busy with, I have to put my sing that note because it's written on the paper, but I just felt like singing it because that's what I wanted to express. So it, I started giving this workshop where I actually create an environment with, with students, with people, and they start improvising. Through improvisation, they actually get into touch with their own creativity uh, and how they move from one note to the next when they're doing you know, music that's written as well, but through finding their own style, their own voice. I ask people to think of a sentence and they use that as the building block for their improvisation. For And people don't actually even realize that they're actually instantly composing melodies. So we basically just follow the rhythm of the sentence and start creating more and more of a melodic line. And then we do an improvisation on a ground tone. And we all are responsible for that ground tone. And then use the material uh, from, for the improvisation, but have contact with other people. You imitate what they're doing or you, you whatever. And then what always happens is when people... The fear is not being, I call it, you know, in front of them as panic, but it goes on their side. Then you get what seems to be swarm behavior. So the individual becomes a group and it moves like a, a school of fish going up, down, and, this, and people become very, very free and very liberated and, and they're improvising, they're finding their own voice. And um, once you unlock that, then I give them techniques that they can use to apply to you know, improvisation. But, and we talk about vibrato, we talk about many things, microtonality, and again, how you can, I mean, why is it that somebody hears something in G flat major and it makes them feel good, or they hear something in C sharp minor and it makes them feel sad, or you know, this kind of understanding how you can use that in written music. So that's pretty much um, the basic thing. And it, it's working towards the, the final presentation. People in the audience have actually said, I'd like you to sing, make a song in G minor on this prophecy of Nostradamus or this recipe of Elvis Presley's mom's mud pie, whatever. And, uh, and then you find, make a structure because the structure is important and then instantly compose it, which is different than, than improvising it. It's improvised, but there's a real structure. And some people feel so challenged, they take a text of a song that's already exists, the Schubert text or whatever, and make their own melody, uh, their own song out of it. It's beautiful to, to, to feel it. I know there are a lot of composing students, uh, composition students who are in, in the room tonight. And I'd uh, Brilliant. L love to, uh, for, for you to take your um, thoughts on this to Clara and, and ask, ask some questions about it. Because I think so many young musicians and musicians in general, we're so used to looking at that white piece of paper covered in black dots and black lines and, uh, and there are crutch. And I think for, for a lot of us, it's really scary just to let go and accept that what you do is good enough. That inner voice that tells you, you can't. Do you, do you have that inner voice? Oh, yes, very much so. I had it today I mean, <laughs> because I, I, I picked this aria that I thought, oh, this aria, I know backwards, I, I know it like the back of my hand. I can sing it like without thinking. And then only when I realized, I thought, oh, God, there's actually there's a very long melisma that has to be in one breath. And I'm, oh, can you do it? No. Can you do it? Yes, I can. Can you? Oh, no, I'm not breathing. You know, so there's this in constant dialogue going on that's um, saying you're not going to make it you are going to make it it's not going to be good enough that note's gonna, not going to be this you know that's and then i yeah i just sort of try to let go and go what i'm in being in the moment i think that's that's a very important thing the mind switch that i have now it's not we make things for posterity we make things that are going to be you know played you know a billion times on on, on, on social media or youtube or, or whatever and that makes us me that blocks me uh, in, in another way Whereas if I do something and the people were there, are the people who experienced it, then what I did was good enough for that moment. And that's, um, that, that was a, that's a very important realization. What I wanted to say about to composers, in case I forget, but they don't, that don't ask, there are two analogies I use. One is it's like having Gianni Versace or Giorgio Armani, let's say, come to you and say, hmm, I'm going to make a dress for you. I'm going to make a piece for you. How would you like it to be? And then you say, okay, I want this to look great 
I want to look good in this part. I don't want that to look too big. I want that to look this. I want that blah, 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 blah. And he'll go, okay. And he'll make exactly the thing that you want. So it's already something that fits you. You just have to inhabit it. So half of the work is already, already done. Whereas when we're doing music that's written for someone else, you have to try and make yourself fit into a dress or a jacket or whatever that was not made for you. It helps me a lot, this analogy. So I love you meet somebody who's living and breathing composer and the dialogue that you have is a brilliant one when they actually are open to what you say. Then you, 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 for example, a lot of composers ask, what is my range? I stop telling them what my range is because it's not about range. It's about tessitura. Do you want to be expressive in a certain range? What is your really good note? The note you can do anything with? What is the part of the range where it can be most expressive? The part that's most intelligible? All these things you don't get when you tell somebody from low G to high. Somebody asked me about my, my body, uh, my, my range, and I said, think of Sophia Loren leaning against the G clef. She's sort of sitting on the E, and then underneath that is her, you know, it's a full, rich bottom chest voice. I can do many, many things. Then between F, and C on the stave is the waist for me. That's the weakest part of my voice. So I would say, oh, bird just pooed on me. How dare you? Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> well, it was, it's just my bare arm. So that's all right. Oh, God, how dare you? Anyway, <laughs> there we are. <laughs> and then I say, so the waist is the, is the smallest part. So if you write something that has full orchestration and forte in the middle, that's a problem. But if you want a different color in the middle, like Mahler did with Mahler 4, he wrote it for soprano and it's written pretty much in mezzo range, but to get a different color. And then as you go a bit higher than C, you get into the chest area, which is quite full and, and round and beautiful. And then when you get up to, you know, above high A, then you get into the head voice. So then it's a smaller and the, per the pieces have been perfectly written for, for me based on Sophia Loren's body. <laughs> That is amazing. And I'm really yeah. sorry about the bird. Yes, uh, it's, great. It's, right. it's, <laughs> it's supposed to be lucky though, isn't it? Yes. I think so, yes. A couple of composers have asked some questions as we're on this subject. Um, yes. Uh, so, uh, Aidan, are you there? I think Hello, Aiden. yes. Right. Interested by you talking about a little bit about microtonality. And as a composer, it's sort of, I've always found it really sort of um, mysterious, sort of fascinating area that I quite like to work in, but it's also been quite a scary area that I don't really know how to sort of tap into. Do you have any advice of sort of better understanding microtonality? Yes, I think, I always think probably the, the thing I would say to you is to actually experience it yourself with your own voice. There's, well, if you're with, mm, you can do it, it's best with two, with another person and you just face each other and you, you, tap into the one person holds a note as straight as possible as, and you try to have as beatless uh, like a perfect unison then you move around perfect fifth perfect fourth minor third major third you'll go into um, uh, automatically it will become uneven tuning and when you're in that mindset if you go a semitone above the person and then just as slowly as you possibly can just start descending, but really slow and feeling every single comma. And you'll hear things like until you actually get down to a, a perfect unison again, where you have no beats. And then you can start playing around with that and see what feels right so that you actually relate your microtonality to a, another tone, if that's what you choose to do, but that you actually feel yourself um, what it is that you want to, to, to create. Uh, would you link that a lot to sort of collaboration, particularly in the case of microtonality, you need, you know, people to work with. It's not something you sort of develop for a, so easily by yourself, I guess. No, no. I think it also a thing is Czech composers, they use microtonality in a very different way than, than uh, somebody from Turkey would use it. Um, so what you might also want to do is listen to Czech contemporary music and see how they use microtonality. But you could also listen to some Arabic music. They use it to create tension and resolution. If they do something like... Uh, and then when they sort of come down, they'll, they'll make it not... They'll use a different 
perfect fit or something so that you get a kind of sense of openness. So you, and it's about, I think in your case, recognizing it, you know, when you recognize when it's happening, even if you don't understand which comet is, and then finding musicians that actually are open to experimenting before you actually write anything, in my opinion, that you just start to feel what, what it feels like. That's fascinating. Thank you. That's a really great answer. Thank you. Good luck. Okay. Um, I've been asked to ask a, a question from, on behalf of another composer, which is yes. when you spoke about placing the fear on your shoulder, how do you approach harnessing some and releasing that fear? I find that the idea of doing something wrong based on our historical musical understanding, very difficult to escape from when training as a jazz singer, but also when composing new and expansive works, especially when dealing with something as individual as the voice. Maybe it's very provocative what I think, but we, you mentioned it before that what's written on paper, we're, we're stuck to what's written. Whereas if you hear even composers playing their own music, it's nothing like what, what's on the paper. So it's a certain kind of, means of jotting something down or notating something but it's not the law is one one point and the other point and i think and it's quite a crude thing to say but most composers or most pieces we do are from people who are no longer with us so they can't tell us um we don't know what they sounded like um i said to somebody once how do we know what they did in in the 17th century based on what somebody writes supposing somebody were to write a treatise re creating a Michael Jackson concert but they wanted or his voice his way of singing somebody did a thesis on Michael Jackson's singing purely on what they wrote and somebody picked it up 400 years from now and they were trying to recreate uh, do an authentic Michael Jackson way of singing without listening how do we know that they're doing it correctly you can say he did this thing with his voice where he went up and then he would grab well not grab but just you know how do you write yeah, yeah, how do you write that with a little vibrato on the, at the end. So I think it's, as we evolve and develop, we get into these kind of strict things of it has to be like this because that's the way, and it has to be like that because, and I think we also bring our own evolution into it. You know, we have a different approach to, to creating sound because we're playing in much bigger spaces for people who pay us, as opposed to having a, a mecenas or somebody that that's the only person you have to impress. It, it's... It's a different way of approaching, but it, it's very much, there should be room for us to put our own individual twist into it. And this whole idea of is the way you do it is the way it has to be. I think one needs to be informed of what the, the feeling was of the time, you know, historically, but also socially. And then you take that and you add your own, it's like you half baked bread you buy from the supermarket and then you finish baking it in the oven. But we need our, we have to add our own history, our own thing to it and, and stop this hopefully this feeling of what we do is wrong because it doesn't sound like this person or that person or still in the realm of composers uh jasper would like to ask a question hi karen hi. um i just want to say first that i really love your recording of pulse shadows with bert whistle i think oh, it's absolutely you. amazing one of the well yeah it's such an amazing piece and you bring it to life um i'm currently starting work on a new opera for next year and i was just wondering if you had to pick one thing to focus on to making it like better than uh, a great opera, what would it be? I'm going to say one thing uh, before, before that and ask you to, to say it again. Um, speaking of Bert Whistle, Paul Shadow, he'd written it. I mean, a lot of it before we'd met and then he was writing uh, the last, I don't know, five songs after we, he knew I would be singing it, but we still didn't know each other. And when we came into the rehearsal, of course, I was like shaking and practically wetting myself. And he said, I can't in imitate his accent. Sir, do you want and then notes changed? Oh, that, you know, and I went, he just changed notes that he said, oh, that sounds much better the way you sing it. Um, and what was an easy note became a, like a five bar high C with a d diminuendo after. And I thought, oh, I sang that maybe a little bit too, too, too well. But the fact is that he just adapted the thing to fit me. But tell me your question again. You're, you're working on an offer. Yeah, yeah so I'll try and word it better. If there was one thing to focus on whether it be story or context and tone of the narrative of the thing, what kind of thing should I focus on more? Mm. The first thing that pops up in me is for you to figure out which is more important to you, the music or the words. Like they say, you know, prima la parola, prima la, la musica. Because if the words are more important, then you, my advice would be to, to write in such a way that the words are always um, 
understandable so that whomever you're writing it for, you really check that when whatever's important that needs to be said is in a range that's, that's understandable. And then you can go off on a tangent when you're doing, you know, uh, emotional things. A lot of composers nowadays, they write quite monosyllabically and very, very complex texts. Um, I've done some things with Michel van der Aar that's quite high and a lot of text talk dealing with mis and not misanthropes, uh, asymptote, turn to something on your asymptote, but on a high G, a high A and a high B. And all you hear is, ah, that, 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 that. So I think for him, both are important, but it's, it's you have to make a choice. And, and if the music is more important, then I would say then you might consider having more spoken text is in your opera so that things, so it doesn't, you don't have this competition where you have singers have to choose to be intelligible at the expense of your music or the other way around, if that makes any sense. Yeah. Do you think spoken word, having spoken word, is detrimental to, for it to be an opera? No, not at all. I mean, the fact that they, people do the magic flute and they do the Entführung and, and Fledermaus and they call it opera, but it's actually, it's a Zingspiel. They're Zingspielen or, you know, Ariad of Noxos. I think also people have to question, we're questioning now what opera, what is the definition of opera? And some people say it's only if everything has to be sung, but then you can't call Lulu an opera either. So then mm. you get a little bit into trouble. And it's like what I was saying earlier, it, it fits. We've evolved in such a way that, that, that opera also needs to evolve. And yeah, if yeah. that means it's turning more into a Gesamtkunstwerk, do you know what I mean? When I, do all you know when I, when I talk about a Gesamtkunstwerk? That seems to be what's happening now in the 21st century and that younger people are seek, are looking for different connections of things because that's, and they're calling it opera and including it in opera and writing meaningful, meaningful things that I think take the position of what opera used to be, which had, which was its finger on the pulse of society actually. John Hartley, the head of composition at the college has just added Fidelio there. There's also Carmen. Yeah, Peter, exactly. Peter Grimes, be brave. That's this wonderful uh, insight. Oh. Thank you, Clara. Ni Thank you. Uh, Ni Nikila, are you there? Hello. I was just wondering, has there been a point in your career where you have doubted yourself and your true inner artistry? And do you think that it is really important to, br to be your true authentic self in this industry? The first question, yes, I doubted. Uh, three times I was... Three, three times? Uh, three times I was actually going to quit because I was not being fed by what I was doing. I was working a lot. Um, there's a lot of stress, stressful hormones come out when we're preparing and when we're singing, but then a lot of dopamines come out as well. So it's in balance and it wasn't happening. I was only very, very stressed because of, of what I was doing. And I thought maybe I'm not cut out for this business because it seemed to be very, very hard. Couldn't really find my place in this harshness because I thought I don't want to sell myself I can blah, blah, you know, I can, I can network and all of that. But I, it seemed that people were actually being, in order to get ahead in the opera world I'm speaking about, it felt at the time that the only way to do it was to be untrue to oneself. And I thought that's what I don't want to do. And that actually at that moment where I ended up, uh, somebody asked me to do something that was completely different that involved improvisation. And that kind of kept me going. Um, and again, this feeling that if I'm not being fed, then I will stop. I'll stop tomorrow. That's actually what's kept me sort of going and, and making the right choices that I think well, that's something that could be good for my career, but I don't want to continue continuously doing that because I'm not being fed. And then it becomes a job. The moment it becomes a job, then that's a moment to, to kind of question if, if it's the right path. It, it might even be just a question of repertoire or where you're singing, or maybe some people like being freelancer, but would be happier having a regular job. But I, I definitely think for me, it's, it's important to be true to one's self and one's instrument. Amen. Thank you for that <laughs> what a wonderful message. We're on the hour, but Maddie Brooks, can I bring you in to ask your question, please? Hi, Karen. I wanted to ask, because um, Tim listed so many wonderful directors that you've worked with, I wanted to ask a bit about what you want from a director in helping create a character together um, and especially with like a brand new role um, like with Flight. Um, and I also wanted to ask about how it, like you talked about improvisation and music and how that's important to you and whether you bring improvisation with the dramatic side of performing operas um, and how those two things meet 
for me, the important thing is, and ha I've worked, uh, has been when a director doesn't come with a suitcase of the whole thing worked out and, the, and says, again, the, the analogy of a coat uh, is the same with the composer and says, here, I've made this, this, this coat. This is where you have to stand. This is what you have to do. This is where you have to look. This is where you have to say this word at this point, on this point in the stage put it on and, 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 and make it work. That's the least inspiring. Uh, it has its own challenges, but the, the, the most, the best uh, experiences I've had is when a director says, we're doing this together. I have a concept. I have a clear concept of where I want to go. I can even see the end, but how we get there, it also has to do with what you bring in and your input and how we create this role together so that it, it's, Again, it's easier to work with because it's already your own experience coming into the into the role as opposed to trying to adopt something. That's been great. I mean, David McVick, McVicker has been the best for this. He, you see him actually, he knows the notes better than the singers do when they start. And when we have the first musical rehearsal, he's just staring at us. It's, it's quite unnerving because he's staring at you and you think, God. But he's just like he's trying to understand who are you as a character, as you as a human being, Claren. And then there's room for that that person to come through in, in, in the role. So that, that's kind of what I would say. A lot of talking, a lot of discussions at the pub after. And just that creating this feeling that singers or performers feel that they actually can say things to contribute to the, to the, to the piece, to the role, to the depth of the character. Thank you, everyone. I always end these chats with a rather crude little game, which is just uh, five questions that I ask. They're just either or questions, uh, one word answers. So uh, are you happy to play this game? Yes. <laughs> Early or contemporary? Early. Opera house or concert hall? Opera house. Recital or recording? Recital. Sunshine or snow? The, uh, nah, sunshine. Stilettos or sneakers? Sneakers. <laughs> Clarence, <laughs> Clarence Friday, it's been just such a joy to, to spend the hour with you. I'm sure I'm not the only one who could, could listen to you and talk with you for, for hours. I've had a wonderful time. Yes, thank you so much. I just want to leave this little note. I was going to say it before. We talked about Bach, Mozart, all these people. They all actually improvised all the time. It's a... Uh, it's, it's, and we improvise in the shower all the time as well. <laughs> yeah, it'd be great. Please come to Cardiff. Uh, I'd and love to. I'd love We'd to. Absolutely love to see you. We're having a wonderful week, Claren, and you've been such a, a wonderful part of that. So thank you. Thank, the thank you so heart. much. Thank you all for your questions and your openness. And I hope I look forward to seeing you all in, in Cardiff. Thank you so much. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye bye. Ciao. Ciao.